In May 1974, a lunch took place in the quiet Hampshire village of Greywell. The venue was the Manor farmhouse. One guest was the Daily Express defence correspondent, Chapman Pincher, who for years had had close contacts inside MI5. Another guest was Sir Derek Rayner, who under the previous Conservative government had been head of procurement at the Ministry of Defence. After the lunch, Derek said to me, now Harry, the way I'm usually known to my friends, tell us all the dirt from Fleet Street. So I realised I was there to sing for my supper at that particular moment, so I told them what was going on. The main uh, thing at the time was Marcia's peerage. Unknown to the wider world, Marcia Williams was now a single mother with two small children from her relationship with the Daily Mail political journalist, Walter Terry. Pincher told the Greywell lunch guests how even Labour politicians were worried that the wrong conclusions about the peerage would be drawn if this got out. Everybody would wonder why he'd given it, and there were these two children, and there was all this fear that he would be thought to be the father, because uh, Wilson and the rest in Number 10, of course, tried to hide the fact that she'd had them. The Conservative leader, Edward Heath, and let it be known that he did not want such scandal to be published by the Tories' friends in the press. But by May 74, the Tories believed Wilson was about to call a second election, which they feared he would win easily. Chapman Pincher told the Greywell lunch party how he'd received a high-ranking visit in Fleet Street. I was approached by an emissary, came to the office in Fleet Street and told me he'd come on behalf of Ted Heath. And um, the view was that uh, the situation was now so bad that anything at all that would damage Labour would in fact be welcome. The emissary, whom Pincher says encouraged him to use scandalous material, was Heath's brightest young aide. I heard that emissary was William Waldegrave, is that right? Yes, it was, yes. I never mentioned him before in a book, but it was William Waldegrave. One guest at the lunch, the historian Martin Gilbert, became increasingly shocked by Pincher's story. He wrote to Heath. Heath replied, denying there'd ever been any suggestion of a Dirty Tricks campaign. Later on, Waldegrave came to see me on his own initiative in the Express and apologised for the fact that um, his original visit had been denied. Now, it's possible that he was sent in the first instance by the Conservative office and that Ted was not informed. Oh, Ted may have been right in saying he knew nothing about it, but um, nevertheless it was true that I had been asked to do what I could to inflict as much damage on Wilson in particular in the uh, pages of the Daily Express. Martin Gilbert also wrote to Harold Wilson about the lunchtime gossip. It was the letter to Wilson that was really important. It set him worrying because it was me and because I was associated with intelligence in MI5 he began to think that I was linked with MI5 and that MI5 was after him. This letter, written in May 1974, was the first time Wilson and Lady Falconder suspected the intelligence services might be plotting against them. They began to see conspiracies at every turn. The summer of 1974 was an unstable time. In May, an intimidating strike by loyalists in Ulster brought down the power-sharing executive. Wilson saw the hand of subversion stoking loyalist fears. I have to say that these fears are unfounded, that they are being deliberately fostered by people in search of power. The army was unusually visible, mounting a series of anti-terrorist exercises around Heathrow Airport. Marcia saw this as a possible military coup. And eventually she persuaded Howard that there was something in it. Beneath the surface, private armies headed by former intelligence officers and generals were being formed to rescue the country when the far left finally took over. Also, hostile talk was taking place at MI5's headquarters in Mayfair. In the office safe of MI5's Director General, there existed a highly secret file on the Prime Minister himself, Harold Wilson. The file's code name was Henry Worthington. In it were reports stretching back 30 years. 
In the wrong hands, they could cause untold damage. Ever since he first became Prime Minister, one part of the job had excited Harold Wilson above all others. He was obsessed, and always was, by the secret world. If you gave a briefing from the Foreign Office about something to him, he would listen carefully. But then if you managed to produce an MI6 report, much more importance was attached to that. And it may only have come from some casual observer in a foreign country channel through a, a secret channel, but because it was secret, he thought it was very important. I think he was fascinated by this undercover cloak and dagger world. What Harold Wilson did not know was that the secret world was equally fascinated with him. In fact, from the beginning of his political career, he'd been monitored by his own security service, MI5. Their reports had all gone into the Henry Worthington file. The reason? His links with Russia. Russia just after the war. A nation trying to rebuild. With the Cold War looming, many on the British left were determined to keep open the door to Stalin. In 1947, a Labour Party delegation visited Leningrad and Moscow. The delegation was even invited to meet the great man himself. The Labour MP's interpreter was a young diplomat, Oleg Troyanovsky. After the conversation, uh, one of them said, when they had left uh, Stalin's house, he said, well, from now on, I will always think of him as good Uncle Joe. <laughs> Another visitor to Russia that year was the young Minister of Trade, Harold Wilson. He soon impressed the Russian leadership. Among those he met was Stalin's foreign minister, Vyacheslav Molotov. Once again, Oleg Troynovsky was present. After the meeting, I recall Molotov saying, well, this is an up-and-coming young man. So apparently, uh, Wilson impressed him in one way or another. In 1948, Wilson was made a cabinet minister, the youngest this century. From Britain's great newspaper presses came the news of new leaders. 31-year-old Harold Wilson, here with his wife and son Robin, takes over as Board of Trade President, while Stafford Cripps... He was a serious young man, even when it came to the burning issue of the length of women's skirts. Oh, that old question. Well, it isn't for me to say um, how the long skirts and the short skirts look, though, of course, I have my own private views on that matter. In 1951, Wilson made a key political move. Along with Anar and Bevan, he resigned over the Attlee government's raising of defence spending and prescription charges. It made him the rising man of the left, but these were dangerous times to take such a position. New York and Julius Rosenberg arrives at the federal court to receive sentence for betraying his country's atomic secrets to Soviet Russia. The Cold War had taken hold. Western intelligence services were on constant alert for communist sympathizers and agents. Despite the dangers, Wilson maintained his links with Russia. He became, for a Westerner, a frequent visitor to Moscow, his trips financed by the East-West Timber Trading Company, Montague Mayer, who'd hired him as a consultant. He developed his political contacts, meeting Trade Minister Anastas Mikoyan, Georgi Malenkov, who briefly succeeded Stalin, Nikolai Bulganin, Defence Minister and later Prime Minister, and Nikita Khrushchev. After Stalin's death, Wilson had the best contacts of any British or American senior politician with the new Soviet leadership. But in the secret world, this made him suspect. It was the view in MI5 that anybody who'd ever been to Moscow, I think it, it was sort of more than five times, and I think that Harold was supposed to have been there about a dozen times, 
unaccompanied by his wife, was bound to have been the target of a KGB effort to compromise him in some way. The MI5 logic was this. Wilson must have been approached by the KGB. But as he had never reported any approach, he was therefore covering it up. KGB officers speaking for the first time about Harold Wilson say this analysis was false. The KGB, in spite of the myths, was sort of a second in command. The Central Committee of the Communist Party was high up. If he was just a tourist, he could be approached by the, by the KGB. But he was considered to be one of the most promising politicians in Britain. You see, the KGB couldn't, couldn't approach him so easily. Simply, he, they would not be allowed to do this. He was meeting uh, our government, and, you know, he had very high contacts. He used to meet Mikoyan and uh, people in the Politburo, and that's why, you know, just uh, there are certain limits. Wilson stayed in Moscow's National Hotel. Like the few other Western visitors, he and his business activities were carefully monitored. Everything was but. He was under very close surveillance, and all the negotiations between him and the timber company were uh, scrutinized by the KGB. As Wilson became a more familiar face in 1950s Moscow, the KGB was still barred from any direct approach. But a more subtle plan was hatched. As a first step, the KGB would offer to trade timber deals in exchange for political information. The design was very simple, to use somehow his interest into some money and to interconnect it with his willingness to, well, maybe to share some information about the Labour Party. You see, to let him understand that it is interconnected. You see, this is, of course, it would be very slowly, not in a way I am telling you, but you see, the main proverb is here, the walk is slow, catchy monkey. But in 1961, Wilson rejoined the Labour leadership as Shadow Foreign Secretary under Hugh Gateskill. He gave up his consultancy with the timber company and the KGB plan died. But MI5's suspicions lived on and were soon revived in a bizarre new twist. In 